This is the Digging Deeper podcast, where we engage in today's questions from a Christian perspective. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Pastor Marty. He is the head pastor here at Burke Community Church. He did his doctoral dissertation on transgenderism. And today we're going to discuss a little bit about transgenderism and discuss the idea of the mind and, and the world and the relationship between those two. Well, last season we talked about, I think you were, you were our first guest, and we talked about what is truth. Um, and one element of that is this idea of um, the mind and the world that you live in and like what do we do when those things are at odds. Um, and so I just would love to, you know, maybe take it back in history and, and like hear your thoughts on um, what that's been like in human history. And I know, I know a subject you know about um, is Gnosticism which is, you know, obviously an expression of that, that worldview. Um, so I'd love to just, you know, give you the floor and, and share with us kind of maybe what that is, what Gnosticism is, and, and how that relates to this idea of the mind's perception versus reality or the physical, tangible reality. Yeah, well, Gnosticism, I mean, it was a Grecian philosophical system that came about shortly, well, scholars debate whether it happened during the time of the writing of the Pauline epistles or shortly thereafter, but some of the things that Paul argues about seem to be as if he's addressing Gnostic tendencies, mm. uh, like pre-Gnostic thinking, which he probably is. Um, so it's a, it's a perversion of truth, perversion of sound teaching, sound doctrine. Um, so it, the word uh, Gnosticism, gnosis comes from the Greek word to, to have knowledge. So if you had their esoteric knowledge, their secret mysterious knowledge, then you had arrived and could be saved, as it were, within their system. Mm. So it was arriving and attaining their level of enlightenment. Mm. Uh, these are all things easily borrowed by the transgender movement because this is, I mean, they're pushing it through the schools and everything to enlighten everybody. It's the mm. same concept. If you're enlightened like they are, then you've arrived and, and you can you know push toward nirvana in a society as it were but if you're unenlightened then you're you're a problem mm. so, so knowledge same, same, plays a big role the knowledge yeah. huge knowledge and very arrogant mm. you know, you're either part of their philosophical system or your system is inferior and needs to be eradicated mm -hmm. same thing you see today mm. you know so you accept our worldview and buy into our esoteric knowledge um or, or your your knowledge base is inferior, mm. so you, you see that arrogance uh, being displayed as they push non-reality on us, wanting us to embrace it. But in Gnosticism, um, the cosmos was created by a um, a god that had issues, basically a god that had problems, uh, and as he created the cosmos, he created beings, and each being was a little less god than the, than the last one. And those, those in their system were called emanations. And so um, when you get down to the final emanation, uh, that would be like the Christ, Christ man, who's the final creator God. Mm. But he's so far removed from God, he's kind of quasi-God. There's a little deity about him, but he's got a lot of man about him, and then there's issues about him. Mm. And he creates a cosmos that's not sinless, but has all kinds of issues, and it's full of evil. And so in their system, the cosmos is the problem. Mm. The cosmos is full of evil. The material world is evil. What matters is the mind. Mm. The mind is superior and must, must gain their esoteric knowledge of things. Uh, and once you buy into their system of thinking, um, then you can arrive at a place of fullness or what they call pleroma in Greek, a place of fullness or what we might call salvation. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's salvation with no savior. It's interesting, and, I mean, because I, as you're describing that, I hear a lot of words that like resonate with Christian ideology, like this idea of the world being incomplete and imperfect, and this idea of like even you know knowledge, like Colossians talk about, like the fullness, Christ is the fullness of of God, or there's this fullness of wisdom and knowledge. So how do you how do you parse those and say, well, yes, both of these have this idea of there's the world, but it's fallen. Because like we like as a believer, you believe that there's this fallen world, but also there's this greater reality. So how do you? How, what are the differences? So so in our in our 
thinking the world the world has fallen because man has fallen. So when men fell, the world fell. Mm. In their system, uh, the mind is everything, and the world really doesn't matter all that much. Mm. And so um, it headed in two directions in Gnosticism. You either became an ascetic Gnostic, like a monk, and cut yourself off from the world, as it were, and did austere things to control the body so that your mind could be improved. Or since the external world didn't mean anything, then you can engage in any kind of licentious behavior that you wanted to, any kind of perversity, and it wasn't pervert, perverted. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they headed into two directions, and the majority of them heading it toward the let's enjoy sex to the fullest thing in mm-hmm. any form thereof. And so, because it didn't matter, your mind is, is what, it, what it was pursuing was the most important thing, the body didn't matter. Mm-hmm. Again, it's easy to see how a transgenderism picked that up, because mm-hmm. your mind is that which is the, the the essence, the most important thing, and what what happens to your body, the external world, is secondary. Yeah. So, can you can you connect that more, like those ideas of, like the mind versus the world, like to how that's played out in transgenderism? Connect how the mind, like that. relates. Well, well, yeah. well, in their system, I mean that's a big discussion. I mean, in in their system, the the mind. Um, the mind, so so in their system the mind has a has has one concept of what how it sees reality which is is in is the opposite of what the body is appearing so uh, in their thinking you know if you have the um, you're born a man but your mind is in your thinking female then it doesn't matter that your anatomy is man mm-hmm. you your mind's telling you you're in the wrong body and so mm-hmm. therefore you have you you treat not the mind you treat the body, mm. so that's when you would do, you know, what they would call gender affirming care, which I think is a misnomer, based on medical evidence. But they call it gender affirming care. So you would change the body to then help the mind be at a place of peace, which is another deception because it doesn't lead to peace when you study national, like forty-year studies, like out of Sweden. It doesn't lead to inner peace. Mm. It leads to great inner turmoil and chaos. But another discussion. Mm. So, so instead of treating treating the mind has a problem and how it sees reality, they treat the, the body, not the mind. We look at like an anorexic person who has a mind-body problem, mm-hmm. like a transgender does, uh, and we treat the mind of the anorexic high school student because we realize the problem is not the body, because it's say it's a you know, five foot seven, 110 pound senior in, mm-hmm. in high school. You can look at her and go, wow, she's got a nice physique, she's in great shape, but in her mind, she's thinking she's a 250-pound female and looks terrible and has got to do things you know, to get a place of health and wholeness. Mm. So she does radical things to try to match her body with her mind, but, her, mm-hmm. but the mind's the problem. So it's the same thing. Yeah. So they, don't, they won't use the same kind of techniques with a transgendered person to help them. They immediately begin to do radical surgery and hormone treatment, estrogen treatment, all that they do to try to fix the body when they really should be addressing the mind. Mm. So just as you would with an anorexic person, you would not, you would not treat their body because their body is not the problem. Mm-hmm. Their, their mind's the problem and how it sees their body. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, it's the one-to-one correspondence when you look at the mind-body problem with transgenderism is why are we treating the body, you know, of a 12 year old girl or boy, and we're not treating their mind, mm. which is m- misunderstanding the reality which is around them, which was our last discussion. Mm-hmm. So that's the issue. We, who don't look at reality like that, look at someone who's anorexic and what, are, uh, honey, you, you're fine. You don't, you don't, you don't need to binge and then throw up and all, do all that, that happens to them mm-hmm. to try to find a place of peace in their own mind. No, you, you need to fix your mind, not mm-hmm. the body. So why wouldn't you do the same thing for a transgender? Mm-hmm. And, and, they, and they don't. Mm. Yeah, what do you think, you know, as, as someone who's outside of that process specifically in like a transgender or, or, or bulimia um, scenario, what do you think interacting with them, with someone who has that mind thought process looks like? What do you think compassion looks like? What do you think, you know, 
like on a I mean on a less less global scale on less like systematic scale I mean like how do you talk to them mm -hmm. yeah yeah I mean well we had a uh, and a oh we have a, a man in our church whose uh, daughter I think she was a high school student at the time a couple years ago um, you know came and told her mom and dad that she thought she was transgender uh, and she wanted to head in that direction um, and you know the parents loved on her uh, said they still accepted her still wanted to be in her life still want to talk to her um, and, and did and did all those things they didn't they didn't write her off mm. um, put her you know made a counseling available for her if she wanted it she eventually went to counseling um, it took about a year um, and now that dad told me the other day that his daughter is you know on to being a, you know a young healthy woman mm. who understands how God has made her and that it's special and that 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 there's not a mind body conflict uh, you know her problem was her mind mm. it wasn't her body and um, and loving on her and accepting her talking with her um, you know really helped her to place mm. go to a place of health and wholeness yeah um, I remember my wife and I ran into that couple um, one time I think it was at a Marshall's store and we ran into the young lady who was you know, dressed in a very bizarre f fashion and stuff like that and as I was talking to the dad my wife um, who didn't even really know the people because of all the parishioners that we have spent um, all of her time just focusing on the young lady just talking to her mm -hmm. you know as if she was just a normal young you know high school student or whatever she was at the time and the dad told me later that that the fact that my wife sat and focused on her and spent so much time talking to her and asking her how her life was going and and having mm. a quality conversation with her meant a ton to, meant a ton to her because mm. she was accepted and she wasn't looked down upon and you know it's just doing it's doing things like that yeah um being the hands and feet of christ 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 hung out with those people mm. uh, but he but he he didn't accept them where they were at. He called them onward and upward to greater mm. things. Um, and we need to do that. But you have to earn a, a right to be able to speak to them. Mm. Um, and and that's, what that, that's what that family did. Not all families act like that, mm -hmm. but that's what that family did. Uh, and their daughter is now what we would term healthy and, and, and mm -hmm. moving on in her life. Because yeah. her mind-body problem is not a huge huge issue anymore hmm. and I, most of them grow out of it statistically anyway hmm. uh, but I think something that's really cool about that story is like the element of time it's not just here's where this person is well let me just hit them with the truth and let just like keep doing that it was this there was a clearly yeah. a lot of patience from the parents yeah. and yeah. love and 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 um, I was I've been thinking about this verse in John where Jesus says to the disciples like Basically, you're not ready for all. There's more I have to tell you, but you're not ready. And so, even even Christ has this um, timing in what's true. That like, yeah, this this is true, but but we don't need to. That's not you know. There's an appropriate time to bring that up or to to have those conversations. But not every conversation is that discussion. Some conversations are just how's life going, and you know what are you interested in, and like you were saying with with your wife. Mm -hmm. And and I'm a neighbor in in my in my neighborhood. Same thing. Uh, college, or daughter's now graduated from college, but uh, same thing. Kind of a lost soul, trying to find herself. Uh, has a lot of of LGBT people in her life who are telling her, you know, that she should try transgenderism and all that kind of stuff. So she's thinking that's the that's the course of her life because she feels like she's got a mind body prog problem, um, you know. You know, I still talk to the girl. I, I mm. still because I because I see her when she's out. Uh, it's not like you 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 know they're like leprous or something. Mm. Uh, they're just they're a broken person that 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 needs you know quality friends in their life to love and respect them, uh, tell them things they may not want to hear when the opportunity's right, and listen to them and mm. talk to them. So uh, and th and that's what Christ did. He pulled up alongside of people mm -hmm. uh, and and talked to them. So. You know, I can tell you all the reasons why Gnostic thinking uh, is wrong, why it's still alive and well today. Uh, but I would never sit down with somebody 
struggling with all that and say, hey, let's talk about Gnosticism and <laughs> how you have bought into a, a philosophical system that is erroneous and false and dangerous and, and huh? You know, mm-hmm. yeah. no, but it just helps an under it helps a Christian understand where they come from mm. and how they think. They they have. I bet you, if you sit down and, and talk to any of them about it, they would have no clue as to what Gnosticism is mm-hmm. at all. Yeah, I don't think I would know what it is yeah. outside of being interested. I mean, and if you follow it, I mean, it, because it goes through history. Because in my dissertation, I had to follow it through history philosophically, but it's a thread. Mm. So you know, philosophy is looking at how do we how do we think about our world. Mm-hmm. You know, and so the Gnostics, this, that's how they looked at the world. You know, later, if you fast forward, when you get to like uh, Rousseau, um, you know, Rousseau's view was man was great when he was in an, in an Edenic type environment and he lived like a savage and can just enjoy his desires to the fullest. Man is only jacked up and messed up when he forms himself into cities and societies and they put rules and regulations on him and, and restrict his freedom and stuff. So Rousseau was like basically a, a what I would classify it. He had been a great hippie in the 1960s when I was growing <laughs> up. It's like, hey man, do your own thing. Mm-hmm. That's when you f- find the fullness, the most enjoyment in life. Do whatever you want with whoever you want, whenever you want. I mean, mm-hmm. that was the 60s, but that was Rousseau, you know? Mm-hmm. So he came along and began to teach that kind of thing. And that, that easily fits into transgender thinking is, mm-hmm. you know, well, those are not two, there's not two sexes and two genders. There is many genders, and then you're then free, once you bifurcate the sex and gender, then you're free to do whatever you want to do. And so this is this is Rousseauian thinking mm-hmm. of doing what you want, and how dare you question what I want to do because it's my version of truth, mm-hmm. as I know it, it's true to me. And so when you go back and you look at philosophy, which I'm sure none of them really do, because uh, it's, you know, it's just, it's just ancient thinking, but it's yeah. still, how many of us look at philosophy? I, we, I mean, there. who does? I mean, it, <laughs> yeah. that's boring. Um, but if, when you read it, you're like, whoa, that, that's totally what I see going on. Uh, restructuring of society, which is what Rousseau did around basically hedonism, do what mm-hmm. you wanna do. You know, yeah. Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher after Rousseau, you know, came along and was answering, you know, the question, how do you view your world? Because um, how does the transgender view the world? Uh, my mind says one thing, my body's saying something else. Mm. My mind's more important than the body, so I need to change the body. So you know, but Kant came along in his day, and how do you view, view the world? Well, his thinking was, you can know in your mind what you think is reality, but you can't know for sure everything external to you is really there. Mm. So like you know, the coffee cups that are here, uh, the tables, the chairs, you, the microphone, you know, I can see all these things, but perhaps it is my mind that has projected these things as realities, but they don't really exist. Mm. I know I can know for sure what's in my mind, but I don't really know for sure what's outside my mind. Uh, therefore, my mind is that which creates reality. Mm-hmm. So what's a transgender do? Same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I can look at my body and see, uh, it looks like I'm a man, but in my mind I'm thinking I'm a woman. So since my mind has a greater power than the body, which is external, I've probably projected all this, then mm-hmm. I can modify it. Yeah, I can change, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah. So it's not like they're sitting around studying philosophy thinking, how can we be Kantian in our thinking? Uh, they're not doing that. They're not doing that at all. But but if you do study philosophy, as as Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, but, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Mm-hmm. These are systems that have been around for thousands of years, uh, devilish in their origin, meant to pull people into unwholesome thinking away from God, mm-hmm. um, and and not answer their life's deepest questions, mm-hmm. and, and deceive them so they don't have peace. Um, they don't find health and wholeness. Um, and they go from thing to thing, striving for purpose and meaning that Solomon talks about, not ever to find it. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why there's a high suicide rate in the transgender community, mm-hmm. because they find out it doesn't it doesn't answer all those questions mm-hmm. that I that I struggled with, and and they're left with um, the reality of they've done things to their body that are irreparable. Mm-hmm. You know, and so you know you can talk about philosophy. Uh, and it's good, it's good to a point. It just helps you understand that kind of thinking and then what the limitations are. It's like in Kant thinking. If I, if I know in my mind what true is true, but outside of me I don't know what is true, then by definition I can't even know if Kant's thinking is true because it's mm-hmm. only true to him. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like. Yeah. 
but it, but that's where they're at. I mean, it's like, you know, when I was doing all my dissertation and, and I think when I finished it, I told my professor, that was one of my readers, I, I had to land this plane somewhere and I landed it, I think 70 genders at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, well, they're way past that now, they're way past 100, but, mm. but that's true to them individually if they're one of those 70, it's true to them in their mind. Yeah. And, and, and so that, I mean, that's, that's just like Kant was saying, but there's a huge limitation to that because it philosophically doesn't fly because mm -hmm. it doesn't match reality, which was our discussion last time. Yeah. But anyway. And I, I think, you know, just hearing that description, that scenario you're describing is like just one of confusion and one of like chaos and uncertainty. And I don't think, I don't say that in a way that's like I, as someone who doesn't deal with transgender thoughts, doesn't relate because I think everyone can relate to that like instability and that fear. But how would you say the piece, like knowing Christ changes that? How does Christ change which facet? Like that, just, you know, the scenario you're describing is one of like, well, I can't really know anything is true and maybe this is true, but it's really just me in my mind versus anything that my mind projects, like this Kantian type thinking. Yeah, well, but to know, but to know Christ, you have to, because Christ died in time and space. Mm -hmm. And so to, to know Christ is to have, have a true view of reality, mm -hmm. as we talked about last time, that um, is there, you know, because you're looking for, uh, did he really, because if Christ really did die in time and space and he really did rise in time and space and the evidence shows that, that he did, then that changes everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a major way. And mm -hmm. so you begin to look, look at the evidence then. Does the evidence corroborate with the fact that yes, he rose in time and space from, from the dead? Mm -hmm. um, that's the that's the view of truth. That's the correspondence view of truth that we talked about last time. So mm -hmm. that that would change everything because I'm looking at truth in a different way. Yeah. Uh, not how they look at truth in a coherence view of truth. My little group thinks this is true. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you're looking at does the, does a statement corroborate with the facts? Mm -hmm. with the f facts. Yeah. There's you know, there's five levels of facts that prove the resurrection. Um, Gary Habermas has developed them in his book on the resurrection. Um, the first four that he argues are, in my view, pretty much airtight to, to validate the historicity of the resurrection mm -hmm. in time and space. And the fifth one is, he says, is a good argument, but not his best one. But, but once you leave my little group of coherence and how my little group sees truth, but it may not match reality, and then I start testing reality based on does it correspond to truth, then I can easily start leaving my false view and embrace a true view. And once I embrace Christ as the Lord who rose from the dead for my sin, my problem is my sin. Mm -hmm. It warps my thinking. It distorts my viewpoints. Um, but once, once I come to know Christ and my sin is forgiven and he gives me his spirit to be with me, then he, according to John 14 and John 16, is my teacher, who Jesus said he will guide you to all truth. Mm -hmm. And he begins to guide you toward truth, not toward falsity. Mm -hmm. um, and then you begin to change. Yeah. What is, you know, what is God's truth about sex and gender? You know? Yeah. And where does he talk about that? You know? Mm -hmm. Well, he made a man and a woman and you have XX and XY chromosomes, and those two together are binary and produce another XXXY mm -hmm. being. That's all they ever do. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can dress up um, as the opposite sex, sex, you could cut yourself up to look like the op opposite sex, you can drug yourself up to look like the opposite sex, but you are still XXXY based on how God created you. Mm -hmm. And because that corresponds to the facts, and that's mm -hmm. what that's what truth is. Mm -hmm. And anything less than that is is not what is truth. Mm -hmm. And and so once you know Christ and you He gives you His Spirit to begin to teach you, then it's not what I think, but what is what has God revealed? Mm -hmm. well, he made a man and a woman. Well, what did He make them for? Well, the only the first command in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, that he directs toward us as after he made us is be fruitful and multiply. That's his command. Mm. 
-hmm. That's so if you go back to philosophy, you know, and study like Aristotle, um, Aristotle was right when he looked at the world, you know, um, when he looked at ca causality, you know, mm. and, and talked about formal cause and efficient cause and all the way we look at our world, but everything that is made uh, has a cause and, and it has a reason why it's caused and what it's for. A mom and a dad were made with different chromosomal capabilities to produce another boy or a girl mm. uh, and gender is just merely a, a statement realizing yeah there's there's two there's not 20 there's not 200 so their whole view that denies denies um two genders has to assume two genders to even argue their point mm. which begins to defy their system so they mm. take our the revelation that god gives and and then then they begin to twist it mm. you know and so no god made you no matter you know how you're constructed to be a man or a woman and no matter of modification drugs or anything can, can change your dna structure mm. i mean you are, you are what you are and gender is just mere a simple illustration of what that is so that's that's a view of truth that you know as you draw close to god and ask him to talk talk to you and teach you um that's what you see. So like when, when you see where like in Romans 1 and uh, I think it's in Jude, where Jude talks about um, sexual sin and stuff like that, it's all related about using the body in a, in a manner that's not natural mm. or not how you were designed. And so as you, as you submit to Christ and follow him and ask him to teach you about sex and gender, you begin to see that that yeah he made you this way but you can use your way body in an un unnatural fashion contrary to how he made you and how he designed you then that is called sin mm -hmm. um their system would accept anything and everything mm -hmm. but god has boundaries and he and anything outside those boundaries would be that which would be sinful and so that's where the scriptures then say you should you th don't do this yeah because you're using your body in a way that wasn't it wasn't designed for which goes back to aristotle which is like mm -hmm. everything that's caused is made for a purpose yeah and has a design about it to achieve a purpose and and when you speak about design it makes me think even like you know this whole conversation right it's it's about we're talking about transgenderism we're also just talking about in general just this disconnect between the mind and reality and that that was in the garden that was you know did god really say that this was bad like there was this oh, maybe actually my idea of what right. this fruit is is right. not what God said. Maybe my idea is different. And I think, well, that, you know. That, yeah. is a, that is a good point because, so what the devil, the, de the, you know, the devil was the chief cherubim, the, the head angel of all of the angels uh, until pride was found in his heart. Mm -hmm. And when you read Isaiah 14 about the five I wills of Satan, um, Pride is the essence of his of his five I wills. Mm. He wanted to be like God so mm. he could be worshipped. Uh, so what's he do to mankind? Um, he causes them to question God as he did, and he and he wants mankind to worship him, mm. uh, and he wants mankind to be duped into the same lie he fell into mm. that you can be God. Mm -hmm. And so that's ha that's how he tempted them. So in so in transgenderism, what are you doing? Well, you are attempting, well, you, you are saying to God, you have made a mistake. Mm -hmm. You've placed me in the wrong body and I need to do things through my own power to correct what you have done. Mm -hmm. And that is acting in a divine status to recreate. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a garden kind of stuff mm -hmm. that's becoming like what the devil attempted mankind to do is the master of your own fate and you know being your own god or goddess um because you don't like what god gave you yeah and i do think that is just so fundamentally like the root of this conversation on these you know just and i mean that's the root of what sin is right it's this idea that well i i can deify myself and i you know and i i remember reading 
in Isaiah not too long ago, and it's talking about like, and it's this passage that's just listing off how the Israelites just created these idols and, and like have this idolatry, but there was this passage that's really beautiful and it talks about how like, like the picture it creates is them, they're creating these idols and they're making these images and they're trying to like, they want to be producers and they want to be creators like God is and they want to be like, well, this is the way reality is. And then it kind of describes the Israelites as like carrying them, like they're carrying these. And so like they're burdens, like they're not meant to be born right. by- no, Isaiah things. talks about this. And uh, Isaiah, it's a figure of speech called maledicto where he, where God mocks the people Mm -hmm. You know, you you beat the metal into a form, you nail it to a piece of wood, mm -hmm. you know, and you bow down before this and thing. And you use that and wood this to is your new food. God. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of those gods were related to sexual perversion. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those gods, like in the Canaanite structure, uh, Grecian structure, Aphrodite, all their systems, there's sexual perversion among the gods. Mm -hmm. And then there's sexual perversion among the people. As a part of the worship of you know, those gods, yeah. So, you know, if you go modifying your body mm -hmm. and changing your body to match what your mind wants, um, you're perverting what God himself designed. Mm -hmm. You're telling him it's not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a, really it's an affront to God, who according to Psalm 139, where David talks about how you're fear, fearfully and wonderfully made, mm -hmm. You are tampering with the hand of the master designer who made you exactly how he wanted you to be for his purposes. Um, and it's male or female, and it's not up to you to choose to create genders that have never existed before in human history mm -hmm. um, to become your own god or goddess. Yeah, and I think, and that's, that's such a beautiful passage on like, you know, the validation of like, this is how God created you. Um, and I think, you know, in that story, in that passage in Isaiah, like it's such a beautiful turnaround because then God flips it and is like, but I created you and I carry you. And it's just almost this like, cause you, you know, there's this human idea that like, oh, if I, if, if it's true that what I think is the way it is, like, isn't that freedom? Isn't that life giving? Isn't that like, yeah, just, you know, straight line, I can do whatever the heck I want. But I mean, there's this, but then you realize that that's a burden and that actually the way it is, is it's flipped that we're, we're supposed to pivot and be the ones who are carried and be the ones who were created. And there's right. like, there's such a, a, such a peaceful surrender, I think, in recognizing that that's who God is. And that's, you know. And it's I think, living, yeah. living in light of how he made you. Mm -hmm. You know, not try to make it into something that it's not, that's a deception. Mm -hmm. that, that's what it is, it's a deception. It's a self-deception, it's a societal deception, and it, and it doesn't match reality. So it can't bring peace. Mm -hmm. You know, and God's like, just, you know, take my yoke upon you, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not heavy, you know? Em embrace how I've made you, and, and he can help you move to health and wholeness. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, speaking of like, you know, the heaviness of, of the burden of kind of buying into ideologies that were my mind trumps, you know, reality. Where to, um, looking back, you know, at history, what, how could we trace what those thought processes, like where they brought up, like where Gnosticism led people through eras? I'm not sure if your studies cover those kinds of things, but. No. Okay, yeah. Nope. No, I only looked at a Gnosticism, Rousseau, Jacques Rousseau, uh, and Kant. And then there's many others. I mean, there's mm. Hobbes, there's a whole bunch of others. But after a 400-page dissertation, I kind of wanted to put the brakes on the thing. Put the period at the end. Uh, yeah. It. <laughs> so after a while, it's like I'm only going to talk about these three guys. But yeah. yeah, there's many more you could you could you could delve into mm -hmm. if you wanted to understand. Um, if you want to understand it, James Sire has a book called The Universe Next Door. Uh, he's an Christian mm -hmm. apologist. Uh, that'd be a good primer for somebody to read that doesn't really read philosophy. He helps you understand. Um, how man moved in a in a chronological format away from understanding God uh, to then deism, you know, to basically ultimately nihilism, mm. where there is no God and nothing matters, and we just live for the moment and do whatever you want to do, which is where we are today. Mm. Uh, he takes you through all of those steps in in uh, probably about 190 pages. It's not a super massive read, but just to give you an understanding of oh. That that's the way. That's why people think like this. Mm. Yeah. You know, it does sound um, interesting. Huh? 
That sounds interesting, yeah. It is, because then it can help you understand how, how people think like that, even though they don't know really know what they're doing in, in, a, in philosophy. But they're, they're espousing some version of philosophy, whether they know it or not. Yeah. And it, and it has weaknesses to it mm -hmm. uh, that will not lead a person to finding answers because the thing defeats itself mm. and, and implodes. And that's where, you, that's where Christ comes in. He doesn't implode. Mm. He gives you the answers that you need to fix you um, but these are all just, you know, they're the, they're the devil's ploy to pull people away. Because mm -hmm. if you figure, if the devil can get a person to think that uh, God made a mistake in how he created me, and I'm a, I got, I'm a woman in a man's body, then I can question Genesis 1 as being valid or not. Hmm. What he do made, you mean, like how so? Well, whether, you know, it's true or not. Because mm. obviously he's made a mistake. I could say he's made a mistake with me mm. and all the other friends in my little coherent group of friends that cohere together. Mm. Uh, we all feel the same way that we have a mind-body problem. So if it's true that, that there's this huge mind-body problem, then, then it's possible that we can question how God created us originally mm. and therefore we don't have to abide by the biblical concept of creation and what we're created for and all those kinds of things. Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's an undermining of what God orig originally did, yeah. how he made a man and a woman. Because there is no way, when you look at um, the word, when, when it says that God fashioned uh, Eve from man's side, from like a rib, mm -hmm. um, the, when it talks, oh, it talks about God doing that, the word in the Hebrew text refers to the woman as being man's doctor, mm -hmm. not just as helper, but the, one of the etymological derivations of that word is to be a doctor. So, meaning the wife is going to be such an unusual creation, she will be able to do, you know, a diagnosis of the man and do things for the man that that no other man could do for that man. Mm. And she's an unusual creation. And if you don't believe me, you're going to be married here. Uh, how long? Like ten like, days. Like ten days, you're going to get <laughs> married. You know, and you're going to find out that your wife is going to be completely different than any guy you've ever known. Mm -hmm. And she can bring things to your life that no man could ever bring to your life. So it would be an outright deception mm -hmm. to think that a man could do body modification, take drug modification, do dress modification, and he could bring to a relationship the same thing that a real woman could. Mm -hmm. that's a, that's a, it's a deception mm -hmm. because that is not how God made him. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so again, so you really, it leads to, by definition, unnatural relationships mm. that will not lead to health and wholeness because that's not a, that's not a real woman. Mm. It's a man who's assuming he's a woman, but he never can be because God didn't make him that way. Mm. But what, why did God make the woman? Well, for all the things that she's able to do for the man, mm. you know? One of them is for provide children uh, and, and et cetera, nurture care. Your wife's gonna be way more perceptive about things than you ever were. She'll remember things really well uh, <laughs> that you'll tend to forget as a guy. She'll, she'll bring tons to your life, tenderness, mm -hmm. joy, you know, lots of things. You, yeah. you, can't, you can't take a person who transitions and give them like the great traits of a woman because they're divinely ordered in the DNA structure of what a woman is. Mm. I mean, I, and I've read all this stuff, just, you know, how is a man different from a woman? How's a woman different from a man? Mm. You, know, uh, you know, like men can, uh, don't withstand heat as much as a woman can. And I mean, there's a whole, mm. there's a list of these things. Yeah. So there's no way you can, you can do any kind of transition and change that man into a real woman or a woman into a, a real man because they'll never be able to have those things because they come from God's good hand. Mm. So then it's a deception. Yeah. And it's a deficiency. Mm. And therefore it's not the path to great life and health and wholeness. Yeah. Yeah, and earlier you were talking about um, the book that's just kind of tracing this, the path of, of humanity in this. Oh, in this book, yeah. Yeah, and so what would you say, I've got two questions for you, um, I'll give you both. One, how would you say where we are today in terms of the the mind, the relationship of the mind and the world, how would you say it's different than other times in history? And how would you say that it's similar and echoes similar patterns? Well, it's changed. I mean, it's changed radically just since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
back in the 60s in high school in the 70s back then you still you still understood that truth was true and it was outside of you and you could you could reason toward that as you looked at facts mm. today they, they, you don't have that absolute concept anymore uh, by and large mm. and so instead of the society believing generally in truth now the what is as we talked about last time uh, it's just it's a it's a fractured society of multiple like little bubbles of belief systems mm -hmm. and i can believe this i can believe this i can believe this none of them have to um, match reality they can defy reality like transgenderism re mm -hmm. defies reality but it's true by definition of that group mm -hmm. and that that's that's history has never had those kind of issues before so you'd say you don't think that cycle has happened like in in throughout history and what not the Roman to the Empire magnitude or? that you're seeing today okay but well. then neither then in history did they have mass media production to be able to mm, to pump this all around yeah. the world and they, they didn't have the drugs that they have today to 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 change people they didn't have mm. the surgical ability to change and stuff stuff like that so the technology has enabled them to take it to a whole new level mm. um so and you, then to and then to teach it, it has to be taught mm -hmm. um, all around the world. Mm. I mean, literally. Yeah, it's crazy it, how technology just amplifies. Yeah, things. yeah. I mean, so it's you know, it's it, the, the world's never had that. You know, because you go back to Aristotle or any of those great thinkers, is they're looking at the world. How do we think about the world? Mm -hmm. Well, all the great scientists, you know, were at the, originally were great Christians. Mm. You know, where there was Galileo, or you go back and look at all the scientists, and they're looking at their world as something that was uh, ordered, structured, had a system, was cyclical, could be understood, and they could they could analyze it because they saw that it had a, a grand design to it that was mm -hmm. very intricate, and so they saw a divine being behind what they what they were looking at. Mm -hmm. So all their hypotheses and things that they would postulate were based upon a, a cosmos that was absolutely there absolutely structured absolutely ordered um but that that's been all thrown out the window mm. and you know now i mean even science is is affected by um thinking that doesn't look at reality that co corroborates to to reality mm. what's impacting even mathematics like in my home state of california you know it doesn't matter you know one plus one doesn't have to equal one. It's, it's the whole, they're beginning to question mathematics. How do we mm. teach mathematics? Because uh, they don't want absolutes. Mm. But when I was younger, you know, it was a different kind of world. Now it's, it's insane. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you can see mm. uh, from what, what they're doing, and then they're forcing everybody, it's like, like believe it or else. Mm. So you'd say even like in, in the onset of Gnosticism or even like, Kant type like thinking that was probably never you're saying that wasn't as prominent as that style of thinking is today no because they didn't have the ability to to broadcast it around the entire world mm. as we do today it's more local I mean pick a culture mm. and you're going to encounter all these kinds of things uh, when you when you go to those different cultures I, I see it when I take people to the Middle East I've seen it when I've last year flying to Germany um, I encountered it on the airplane with a transgender, you know, uh, British soldier sitting next to me, um, a man who looked very much like a woman, but it was a man. Um, it's it's all over the place, mm -hmm. you know. And so we've never had it to that magnitude, I don't think, in human history before, because we didn't have the capacity to do it mm. with the internet. Yeah, you know, I mean, back in my day, um, you had a television with two stations, <laughs> and it was black and white. Mm -hmm. You know, now your child can sit down with their uh, iPad and connect to the the world. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different enchilada, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> and therefore, good things can be taught and pushed, and evil things can be taught. Mm -hmm. And so it has a it has a greater, you know, uh, ability to be to be broadcast. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well. We'll wrap up here shortly, but um, I know you've got your talk at the 
Digging Deeper conference coming up, and I know you have five. Your your talk breaks down into five kind of points, right? Do you want to give us maybe a teaser, talk about maybe one of those points, um, maybe how it relates to this conversation? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, um, one of the one of the things that we didn't really talk about um, is the the medical evidence that's available today, more so than when I wrote my dissertation. So that was been what like five, five years, year, yeah. five years ago. I mean, a lot has happened since then. So th so I've kept track of medical data since then because um, now they, they have many more studies that they've produced. Um, what you're not being told is the ramifications of the medical findings, mm. and they're not positive. They're very detrimental. So what happens if a, if a young man uh, transitions and begins to take you know, estrogen or whatever he begins to do, um, or if a young woman begins to take testosterone, now they have now they have many studies uh, which show the detrimental nature of these things, what it does to the human body. Mm. So to call it gender affirming care, as I said earlier, I think is a is a misnomer because there's nothing affirming about it. When you look at the medical evidence, it's destructive care because of what the that medical treatment is doing to the human body. That is not what they're telling people. Like mentally, phys like physically? Well, that's a whole other discussion. Both, yeah. Not like mentally what it does to them. Mm. Um, that's another discussion, but just medically what it does to them. So mm. destroying your cardiovascular system, mm. you know, ex your pulmonary system. It begins to degrade your system, and it does not lead to life. Mm. It shortens your life. Uh, because your body's not meant to take those things that were not, weren't designed for your body mm. by how God made you. So you're living in an unnatural way, and there's consequences to doing that. And so our culture isn't talking about that at all. You know, uh, media, they're not talking about that. Mm. Uh, and so I'm, that's one of my points, is uh, you know, one, of the, one of the flaws of their thinking uh, is medicine is a be-all, end-all, and, and helps these people. Um, that is not true. Mm. Uh, medicine, uh, it is very dangerous as people partake of that and they would really need to look at the studies to understand what happens to you when you start doing this mm. to your body. It's very destructive. Mm. Um, so that's one of my five points is I'll look at you know in details some of those studies because that's what we need to think about mm. yeah and talk and talk about because mm. yeah. if you really love somebody, you're going to warn them, not to go down that road because of what it what it w will cost. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that, yeah. and uh, we're excited to hear your your talk at the Digging Deeper yeah. Conference. Yeah, it should up. be insightful. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Pastor Mark. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thanks for tuning in. To hear more, go to digdeeperdc.com.